The first answer to this question was to introduce the concept to cable television companies, which at the time had fewer than 100,000 subscribers. Bear suggested they create interactive video game channels, an idea that was 40 years ahead of its time. Because all it took at the cable station is to take a camera, point it at a nice colorful chart, and say uh, uh, the stands on the at Wimbledon, yeah, a tennis game, the, the court in the front, and uh, we key our two spots, our two spots, and we didn't even need the, the line in the middle if they did the camera, if they did the picture right. Uh, key our two player spots, paddles, and the ball over that background, and we have a nice, rich looking presentation uh, uh, instead of sticking overlays on, on top of the screen. At the time, however, the cable companies showed little interest in what today has become a major segment of their business. This led Bayer to the TV manufacturers. Once he realized his new game used many of the same components found in your everyday TV set. Uh, first to come in was RCA. We actually got into a protracted uh, negoti contract negotiation with them but they thought we were a little company, they were a big company, and they made the term so onerous that we uh, decided not to go with them. Fortunately for us, uh, a member of the team, uh, the, RC the RCA team, left RCA, became a vice president for marketing at Magnavox in their sales office in New York. And he was so impressed with what he saw, that he called up the people in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the headquarters, while well, the engineering was, I say you ought to look at that once more. I tell you, when uh, when the, the VP in New York told those guys in Fort Wayne to invite us in, and we made the demonstration, which kicked the whole thing off. Uh, when that happened, uh, we knew we were eventually going to get a license. But it took our lawyer, corporate director of patents, and their lawyers a whole year to grind out a contract. So now our old design, a design that built it basically in 67, 68, is already three years old, right? And electronics moves like crazy in three years, right? And we went back once more, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But after that, it was, uh, it was a, uh, it was a hands-off situation. They're different company, we're one company, what another company, and they didn't really feel that they needed us in any way. And in fact, they didn't really, because they did a really nice job converting a brown box into a producible and uh, good looking and practical piece of equipment. Uh, for, we didn't know, for example, which we found out much, much later, in fact, Bill really doesn't really know any about this, that they spent an entire six months after they made about six or eight handmade prototypes going all around the country with uh, doing uh, consumer acceptance testing, some of which is reproduced in my, my book, uh, to find out whether people would really like to do that. And if you look at those records, they're uniformly positive. People really like the idea, really like playing, especially big part. Finally, on May 3rd, 1972, Magnavox decided to take the lead and offered consumers the first video game home console, which they called Odyssey Magnavox. Here we go, up and down and up. He's getting tricky. Uh, missed it, one up. Keep it on the table, Bear. Here we go. Take the out again, two to one. We'll play up to five, huh? Good show. Get closer to the net, make it a little faster. Well, two up. 